Christmas 1892, and Arthur Conan Doyle was the most famous writer in the world. Thank you, Mr. Greenough Smith. <laughs> his creation, Sherlock Holmes, was so convincing that many of his numerous readers thought him to be a real detective. You're as good a performer as that, Arthur. What about public readings? Hmm? That should be our next step. Look at Dickens. Oh, That's what Dickens. made him famous. <laughs> oh, come, Mr. Greenall Smith. Surely my son is more famous than Mr. Dickens. Oh, I don't <laughs> doubt it, Mrs. Doyle. And I wouldn't be surprised if Sherlock Holmes is even more so. No, there's a captain of the ship that I was telling you about forbade me to join my shipmates because he said that the ice was no place for a novice. So, How could anyone have guessed that in less than a year he would be accused of committing a terrible crime and his life and career risk ruin? <laughs> it's a, a magnifier. <laughs> No clue you can, can escape, escape you. Now. <laughs> <laughs> Aha! A messenger. Thank you, my sweet. Is this from you? No. You should be in bed. Say good night. Night night. See you in a minute. All right, my love. Is it Arthur? Oh, it was just business, rather than festive. You're beautiful this evening, ma'am. Thank you, darling. Mm. I have to go to Scotland. But why? I can't believe 
you went there. Why didn't you tell because me? Because I needed to see him. I wanted to talk well, to I him. I told you before, I don't want to hear this. It's been a terrible injustice done. He shouldn't be there. So what are you proposing? Leave it alone, Arthur. You, of all people, know how far we've come. A matter of honor, and I beg you. I have always not... accepted your notion of honor. I've lived by it, and I always will. <sighs> I know we never speak of this, <sighs> but I went there, and I have no idea. No, how... you have no idea, and I beg you to stop this now. Father, it's Arthur. When did he do these? Some time ago. He's not been doing very much lately, as you see. I have no idea it would be like this. I want to talk to him. I'm sorry, he's been in this state for several weeks. And, uh, box has nothing distinctive save two thumb marks at the left bottom corner. It is filled with rough salt of the quality used for preserving hides. And embedded in it are these very singular enclosures. You have observed, of course, Watson, that the ears are not a pair. They're fresh, too, and have been cut off with a blunt instrument. This is no practical joke of some medical students from the dissecting rooms. We're investigating a serious crime.
Doctor Doyle! Oh, Harry Howe. Am I may have guessed it was a reporter? You've been following me. I have been looking for you, sir, but not following. I was hoping to get a story before you go. People won't stop talking about Sherlock Holmes. The public just... I've got a train to catch. I'll maybe talk to you when I return. Goodbye, Dr Doyle. I'll see you when you get back. Harry. You're sure you haven't been spying on me? I saw somebody looking through the window of my study the other night. A Sherlock Holmes fanatic, maybe. There are lots of them about. I'm sure of it. Somebody's been moving them. It can't be, Arthur. The servants know not to touch your papers. It must be the wind. So the story of the severed ears, is it finished? Oh, yes, 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 it's finished. <sighs> Shall we take a holiday? Yes, where should we go? Switzerland. Place, please. Can we go? It says cross. You're all right. Yes, I think so. I'm just out of breath. I had to shout so. Sorry. What is it? I thought I heard. Seeing that reporter has upset you, hasn't it? They're like maggots. People won't stop talking about Sherlock Holmes. Always, always Holmes. You know, the more there is of this, the less I want no, to write. No, no. Fear, cry. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> A consultant said it's consumption. I don't know why I didn't see the symptoms when I talked. It's not your fault. practically accused me of manslaughter. I think he's being too gloomy. I mean, with lots of rest and care and attention, there's every chance I might recover. Well, we'll do everything we can. If we have to go abroad to beat this, then we'll go abroad. Davos. Davos. Some wonderful sanatorium.
There is a telegram, sir. Thank you. Will there be a reply, sir? No. No reply. To inform you with regret, your father Charles died after a fit early today, the 10th of October. I am the living spirit. I am at peace and in harmony with all life and with all vibrations. In all my being, to help us increase our understanding of life. So, are you here out of curiosity, or is there someone? I've always been very interested in the subject. Is there someone? Charles. It's my father. Have you a reason? There's something I'd like to tell. I'm begging you to reconsider, Arthur. Have you any idea of the consequences? My mind's made up. And I would ask you to promise me that from now on, you won't mention his name. Do other work by all means. Write anything you like. I will support you. But why take this step? It's hardly generous after all that hurt up. Your friend. Sorry. <sighs> I'm sure you will find it harder than you imagine. I still don't understand the reason. There are many. Well, I can only hope you will think again. You must, Arthur. Arthur, we must talk about what you told me in your letter. You can't be serious. Yes, I am. I thought about it a lot lately, and now I'm sure. I've spoken to my publisher about it. Sherlock Holmes takes my mind from better things. If I don't finish him, he could finish me. Think of the questions it will raise. People will make the connection. You could finish us all. You can't, you won't, and you mustn't. It is with a heavy heart that I take up my pen to write these last words in which I shall ever record the singular gifts by which my friend Sherlock Holmes was distinguished.
and in that dreadful cauldron of swirling water and seething foam will lie locked in each other's arms for all time, the most dangerous criminal and the foremost champion of the law of their generation. As the world mourned the death of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur was threatened, insulted, and mocked. Some people wore black armbands in the streets. Others wrote abusive letters of protest at the killing of their beloved detective. But he held firm to his belief it was justifiable homicide. threw himself into writing a series of novels, many historical. Work, as the detective himself once commented, is the best antidote to sorrow. I've lived for six years in a sick room. I know how weedy of it I am. Finish your story. Yes. Yes, finished. You used always to be so pleased when you finished. to reach him. I'm sorry. We cannot call up the dead. It is the dead who come to call on us. As you can see, Arthur, people have still not forgotten. I think I don't know that. They write to my home. Some of them threatened me. And will the man himself, for since he won't let me say the name, that is what I must call him, ever return? Herbert, while he lived, I barely wrote a novel. Since his death, I've done six. True, but... Uh... Ah, honesty versus tact. It's always a difficult struggle. Come on, let me have it. Several I know have not pleased the critics. Or the public, Arthur. That's low. So, what to do, hmm? Now, as we have discussed, there would be serious interest, and I believe, serious money to be made from a biographical memoir. It's almost as bad. I'm sure it would sell. <laughs> it would keep you in the public eye and help your other books, too. You could use all your early experiences, the Arctic, Africa. I believe we could have a coup. And if you're worried about checking dates or any other donkey work, there's a good man here who could help. Who is he? The model of discretion. Very unobtrusive. And very enthusiastic. Now, just let me send him down for a talk. It's all I ask. Well, I might think about it. What's your present? Oh, uh, it's for Kingsley. I uh, can't resist him. Soldiers. Yes. You could be the brigadier. I could be the captain. Really well, I killed. No, I won't. <laughs> you killed him. Remember your story of the seven deals. In revenge, I will cut the ears off your head and leave you screaming.
I am aware you have such need. And I'd hope tonight you might be fortunate. Because today I felt very close to the other side, but... I'm so... I'm sorry. Yes. Night, night. I'm... I'm just sorry that you could not reach him. Yes. Yes, I, I, I wanted to, to say... Uh, no, I was, I was hoping... To, I was hoping to ask... Yes. No, no, it, it, it's nothing. It's nothing. Please, excuse me. What's your name? <laughs> it's Jean. Jean. Excuse me. Ah. Who are you? I'm the biographer, sir. The housekeeper said I could wait till your return. Cleve should never have let you in. I remember my publisher mentioned something about it, but I should have been warned. And that's... That's Claridine, incidentally. It's not cocaine. Take it for my neuralgia. I hope Greeno Smith told you that I'm not keen on his idea of a biography. We're very hopeful you might consider it, sir. Why? People greatly admire your work, myself included. Which books? I've read them all. But I believe Holmes. Always, always. It's always the same, always Sherlock Holmes. I mean, why is it never, why is it never Clark or, uh, or Brigadier Gerard or, or, or Rodney Stone? Well, but why is it always the same? Why is that? Why? Because he has fascinating qualities. All of us would love to understand I'm that. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Selden. Selden. Mis I'm sorry, Mr. Selden. I've no interest in this, and I should have been notified. So I bid you good night. It's unfortunate you have had a wasted journey. That is not a problem, sir. I just hope I can be of service to you if you Good have a night. reconsider. Good night. And again, my apologies. Good night to you, Dr. Doyle. Mr. Selden! Mr. Selden! You're not the fanatic who writes threatening me with death for having killed him, are you? On oath, I have never written to you in my life. Good. Well, come in! grateful to you, sir. And I had meant to make one thing clear, Dr. Doyle. Everything will be treated in the strictest confidence. And you realize that I may never allow any of this to be published? It seems hardly much of a prospect for a biographer. <sighs> and no doubt you think we should start with my detective. I suppose his method may apply to biography. 
Gather facts, arrive at a conclusion. I'm sorry. I don't take him and his method as seriously as you. All we thought at this stage, sir, to help with any venture of this kind, is you allow me to establish a chronology. Undertake some research. Research? Oh, of course, I'm prepared to sign a legal undertaking never to divulge or publish anything without your consent. You may reveal nothing to anyone. Not even my publisher. That is understood. much of a writer. <laughs> Why? Because... Because I can't express how wonderful it feels to see you. Two weeks is too long, Arthur. Two minutes is too long. Yes. And yes, we would like some tea, please. Mm. And... Cakes, cream cakes, if you have them, and some crumpets, <laughs> and, and scones, and jam, and cream. <laughs> Hungry? No, no, not the slightest. I just enjoy the luxury of giving you things. <laughs> Well? No. And since he has sanctioned this, I will tell you whatever you wish to ask me. I understand that nothing will be published unless we wish it to be. That is so. But I think it would be a wonderful thing to understand once and for all what gave rise to his detective. <sighs> Very well. I am prepared to be frank. About those early years in Edinburgh, whilst he was at the university, I know there were difficulties. Well, I doubt it will be worth printing. <laughs> it is only a beginning. But I want to know how it was. How it was? I'm aware that your husband was ill. Ill, Mr. Selden. Do you want me to tell you about the smell in his room? It was the smell of damnation. That room was his entire world. And he would ah! scream, crawl on the floor. He would lie drunk for days. And all we could do was save our honor by protecting him from the outside world.
And so you see some of what you described of your husband in your son's work. I'm thinking of such stories as the twisted lip and the brutal violence induced by alcohol. Stories of terrible family secrets, including those who cut the ears off their lovers or beat them to a pulp. Well, the truth is, Mr. Selden, he murdered us. He murdered us. I never thought my mother would say so much. I admit I was somewhat surprised myself. Well, she knew I had sanctioned it. It's the only copy. Just as I undertook. I'll almost certainly destroy it. I hope you don't mind. It is our arrangement. It's very hard for my mother in Edinburgh. There were times when life was desperate, and I've never pretended otherwise. I sympathize, sir. Do you? I admit it's affecting to hear it in her own words. I confess, I cannot quite see how the family managed without support. Is there anything you wish to add? No, no, I don't. Don't. no, 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 That creature locked away in an upstairs room. Sometimes a doctor, a friend of my mother's, would come around and with his help would have to restrain him. Every day I consider other options, but I can't abandon Louise. And I won't stop seeing you. I believe in you. And who knows what this new century will bring. If I hadn't met you, the last of the old would have been nothing but torture. I live in a sick room. My father's dead, and so is my detective. Do you miss him? No, not for a moment. My publisher still talks of him, but nobody seems to understand the problem. I, I didn't mean your detective, Arthur. I meant your father. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know how badly you wanted to make contact. Yes, I'm sorry. Mm. How did he die? Alone. Been ill for many years. And meanwhile, my detective was mourned all over the world. More obituaries than a king. Sometimes, I wish that Sherlock Holmes had never been born. But uh, I'm rambling, I'm sorry. I, I just thank God for you, Jean. Die for you. Joseph Bell. 
I'm just trying to understand the background to his creations. And of you, some have said... That I am the model for Sherlock Holmes. Has been mentioned. Ah. Were you and Doyle close? Well, he was my clerk. Well, that hardly answers the question. Um, it was a very difficult time for the family when he became your clerk. Have you any idea how they managed? A question for him, surely. To be candid with you, I do not see the answer very much as anyone's business but our own. If Mr. Doyle has sanctioned this interview, I am perfectly happy to give it, but only on my own terms. I want to ask you then about this method you taught your students. It was a form of detection. Yes. Are you married? No. My wife died before ever I met Arthur Doyle, Mr. Selden. She was barely 30. I was very busy. My medical work was consuming, but it was not enough. I became interested in criminology and forensics and the ability to deduce facts by uh, observation. It was a kind of mission, a means of universal deduction. In fact, there is one occasion which might indeed illustrate it for you. Now, before I address the next patient, I want you to look at him carefully, remembering the method I have taught, and observe everything and anything that can be observed by his first appearance. He has a limp, perhaps a sprain of some kind? Not much, in other words. You see, but you do not observe. <coughs> Can nobody observe anything? Nobody? That he is in need of medical attention. <laughs> Why not ask him? <laughs> I admit... He has few distinguishing features. I can observe very little. Except that he comes from Liberton. He drives two horses, one bay, one grey, and he has recently been discharged from the army. It's all true, but how in the world do you can, sir? Exactly. H how do you know that? Well, I am tempted to leave you wondering. <laughs> It's always much more effective. <laughs> but I will explain. There is Liberton clay on his toe caps. The colour is unmistakable. The boots are new. Undoubtedly ammunition boots, the kind offered to any soldier on his discharge from the army. There is white equine hairs on one sleeve, bay on the other. Two horses, one bay, one grey. <laughs> but these are precisely the methods of Holmes. It is also said that you enjoy the celebrity of being the inspiration for Holmes. Yes, it is said. I played my part. I was amused. Good God, man. I was Queen Victoria's physician in Scotland. I hardly craved any attention. You talked earlier about your interests in forensics and criminology, but surely they were more than mere interests, were they not? There have been newspaper reports that you assisted the police. I have never talked about that before. And I will certainly say nothing now. 
Yes, it's very interesting, Mr. Selden, but there's little that's new. Bell's changed less than I thought. Morning. Probably thinks I'm out talking to myself. Well, it's a righteous privilege. Yes, as I said, there's little that's new. Oh, but I think that there is. This matter that Bell refused to talk about. Uh, all right, you say nothing, but some facts are common knowledge. I'll say nothing if I choose, and I would ask you to remember it's you who are supposed to be working for me. Very well. Now, let me take you back to the year 1878, when Bell made you his clerk, and Eugene Chantrell was hanged for the murder of his wife. He singled out Bell as the man responsible for his arrest and conviction. You must have known about it. It was the gossip of Edinburgh. You acknowledge him as your detective, and yet fail to say he was one. Why? Very well. Everyone knew the rumors about Bell, so I acknowledged it. It's what I was bound to do. But I had no wish to intrude further. <laughs> <laughs> intrude? Bell invented the technique. Bell pioneered forensics. Bell investigated crimes, and you were his clerk. The man was Holmes. I appreciate your dedication. Mr. Selden, but the Green Oath Smith really intended to play the prosecuting counsel like this. Bell was much less of a calculating machine than Holmes. It almost seems there is something about the subject of Bell that unnerves you. He made you his clerk. Why? There's no reason, and I don't know why you say that. Then let us return to Holmes. Was he, as you have just said, a calculating machine? You use that phrase constantly to dismiss him, but surely the truth is he was loved by millions precisely because he often displays great emotion. The moody violin. And this. There is nothing in which deduction is so necessary as religion. Our highest assurance of the goodness of providence seems to me to rest in the flowers. The rose is an extra. Its smell and its color are an embellishment of life, not a condition of it. We have much to learn from the flowers. Are these the words of a calculating machine? His passionate moral sense, the embracing of London's mood, the crusader against darkness and evil. You made him so real that people almost seem to believe in him. More than me, yes. I only wish Doyle would apply himself to what he's good at. You know, he won't even allow me to mention the name. I have to call the late detective the man himself. <laughs> the man himself. <laughs> In your dealings with Doyle, did you ever arrive at any conclusions about what lay behind the stories? I know Bell had a strong influence, but there's much more he's not telling me. Did you ever have any sense that the family's problems in Edinburgh may have lay behind their creation? There was one thing, only one, but I would ask you not to mention it to him. Go on. It was getting on for Christmas about um, seven years ago. We'd been discussing illustrations for the new stories, and I'd wanted him to see everything that had been done in that line. He was becoming quite engaged with the exercise. So I brought out our old copies and also um, old books that I had. Anything with illustrations of Sherlock Holmes. But I'd forgotten one set, so I came back in here for them. I was never sure if he knew I'd seen him. Of course, I wanted to know which uh, Holmes story caused the outburst. A Study in Scarlet, with illustrations by Charles Doyle. His father's illustrations of Holmes done from a mental institution. It was tactless of me, I suppose. I'd forgotten the book's existence.
They do not look like the work of a madman. No. The same thing occurred to me. They are just a little dull. We could never have taken them on for the Strand. What's the meaning of this? Is there something wrong, sir? Well, look at it! It's a medallion of bacon, sir. Is there something wrong with it? Shall I have it taken away and cooked no. more? No. I'm not hungry. It's, it's all right, Anna. Just take it away. Sometimes I feel so low and wonder if we should go on and if it is wrong. And then I feel guilt and I worry for you thinking I'm only a burden. Sorry, Arthur. No, there's... There's nothing to be sorry for. Glad you came. So am I. You said... <laughs> Sometimes I've... Like the last few nights, I despair. As if I have to play every piece I know, and I play, and I play, and I play, and I play, and, and then I just feel exhausted and desperate. It, it'll pass. It will pass, yeah. Yes, I expect it will pass, Arthur. Everything does eventually. Like these things, will that be us in the next century? Dust. Be careful. Or you might inherit my taste for the macabre. <laughs> I wrote a story once called The Cardboard Box. It's, it's about a pair of severed ears <laughs> and a box of salt. And now I see them everywhere I go. <laughs> I don't want to stop seeing you. I couldn't bear it. No. No, that won't happen. Are you all right? God, Arthur, are you all right? Hmm. <laughs> I want to go there. I want to enlist. What? For a situation. There's a few hundred soldiers guarding thousands of civilians from a hostile army. It, it, it's one of the most heroic things I've ever, ever heard of. Arthur, that is a mad idea. What, well, why? For one thing, you're too old. And for another... Oh, what, that? Don't you understand? That's what I want to get away from. Well, my door is always Open. You think playing at soldiers is the same as going to war? Soldiers with Kingsley. Herbert, I can hear you. Well, leave them. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. 
Miss Lackey. Dr. Doyle. Well, they're all here. Are they? Good. I'm fine. Are you sure this is wise? Nobody will attack us. We'll go through together, arm in arm, as honored friends. Now, whatever could be wrong with that? Oh. Mom, this is Jean Leck. Jean, this is my mom, Mary. Oh, lovely to meet you. Oh, I'm so you. pleased you're here. Come along and meet everyone. Brian, this is Jean. Nice to meet you. Yvonne, Please. Gary. <laughs> My brother-in-law, Willie Horngun. Hello. And you will remember none of them. <laughs> Thank you. So do you support me in what happened last night? Yes, completely. Well, Willie seems to see it differently. He says he isn't asking you to renounce your friendship with Miss Lackey. No. No. He says I insulted my wife and betrayed my marriage. I said to you and to everyone else, I betrayed no one. I may wrestle with temptation, who doesn't? But I win. Arthur, you know I accept that. And I believe that Willie does too. His reservation is that to, to him and some others, it makes little difference if your relations have remained platonic. In other words, he makes no distinction between guilt and innocence. So it only matters how things are viewed. And I suppose I should expect nothing better from a journalist. Thank God he's not a detective. <laughs> or a judge. I think she's lovely. She's beautiful. Do you? Yes, I do. We both know how unfairly the world can judge and apply impossible standards. <laughs> if you wish, I can try to talk to Willie further. That's kind. But I don't think there's much point. Can't tell you how isolated I sometimes feel. Oh, I know. Why pepper shortage in Bafferty? Fight the rears. Well, because they can't. They're trapped, you see. But what a situation. With just a few hundred soldiers guarding thousands of civilians from a hostile army. We're going to have to pray for them. Kingsley. 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 Kingsley! <laughs> Has anyone ever told you you have a bad habit, Mr. Selden? You creep rather than walk. I always had the impression you preferred quiet in your study, sir. And I always had the impression that you were well-mannered up until now. Do you not want to continue? No, Mr. Selden. I do not. My mind is elsewhere. Very well. That has always been our agreement. But would you not like to hear my findings? <laughs> Have I not read them? Oh, you read only the evidence, Dr. Doyle. I mean my conclusions based on that evidence. Conclusions? About what? About the matter we first discussed, the source of your creation. Very well. Let me start with that watch I notice on your table. It belonged to your father. May I look at it? Thank you. 
Thank you. It's very interesting. I repeat your words about your own father. After a time, anything fragile or of value had to be removed from him. Is there not then one major moment in your detective stories where you draw on your own life? What? Here, the sign of four. One of the most famous scenes of deduction you ever wrote. Watson tests Holmes with a watch that belongs to his brother, who was a drunkard. He is devastated by what Holmes finds. And we only have to change the parts a little in the setting. Suppose it was you who were testing your arrogant teacher, Bell. As you know, I have often informed you, it is difficult for any man to keep an object in daily use without leaving his personality upon it. Now, young Doyle there has showed some skepticism of the idea and has offered a test of my method with an item he has. And I am delighted to accept. <laughs> Ah, hmm. There are barely any data at all. It has been recently cleaned. Yes, I oversaw the cleaning myself. But surely, Dr. Bell, it illustrates the limitations of your method. Possibly so, but the investigation was not entirely barren. The watch, I'm sure, belongs to someone from the generation above me. The owner is, yes, a man of untidy habits, untidy and careless. He was left with good prospects, threw away many chances, has for some time lived in relative poverty, with occasional short intervals of prosperity. After that, he took to drink. His mind went. And that is absolutely all I can tell you. Well? Yes. Mr. Doyle, your watch. Thank you. Mr. Doyle, what can I do for you? I hope that proves the point. No, it does not. That was beneath you, Dr. Bell. I couldn't believe you would descend so low. I do not follow. It's well, you know, this is, this is my father's watch. And it's obvious to me that, that somehow you've got wind of my family history and now you, you, you parade it before your students to boost your own reputation and that of your method. Now, to expose a painful family secret in such a fashion isn't merely unkind. It, well, well, to be frank, there's something of the charlatan about it. My dear Doyle, seeing the matter merely as an abstract problem, I had not considered your personal feelings. I can assure you I am quite unaware of your family circumstances. You could be an orphan for all I know. Well, then, in God's name, how? Same as ever. Observe the small facts upon which larger inferences depend. May I? The bottom half of the watch is dented, marked, and cut from the habit of keeping hard objects such as keys or coins in the same pocket. To treat a 50 guinea watch like that marks a careless man. Through the lens, I can see many pawnbroker's marks, hence the hard times. But clearly, sometimes he had enough money to redeem his pledge. Finally, look at the scratches around the keyhole. Mark where the key has slipped. 
What sober man's keys could have scored those grooves? And then observe here how seriously disturbed and destructive they are. Well beyond mere drunkenness. So, have I at last shown you something? I don't say I haven't exactly as you described, but yes. I will admit that passage is infused with my own memory of those times. But how much further does it take you? It was a starting place only, but a very important one. Next, I had to consider the evidence that led on from the incident with the watch. Namely, that Holmes emerged from the experience of your teacher, Joseph Bell, during what must have been one of the lowest points in your life. Mr. Selden, I know that you're a fanatical admirer of the character, but please spare me the imitation. All this is known. What else could you have derived from these interviews? In themselves, only a little. But put them alongside other facts and we begin to make progress. First, I have to tell you about my last visit to your mother's house in Edinburgh. I told you there were still things I didn't understand. Namely, the financial position of your parents, and then these strange drawings of Holmes by your father, shown to me by Greenall Smith. But before I could discuss these matters with your mother, I discovered what you already knew. that she had not lived there for several years. You mocked me. And while the clues to her disappearance had to be dug out, some apparently trivial, they are there. Oh, yes. And they are enough for any good detective. There are, I believe, several of particularly compelling interest. One, the circumstances surrounding your choice of career as a doctor. Two, the reason Dr. Bell chose you as his clerk. Three, the date of your father's death. Four, the full name of your youngest sister, Brian Mary. Five, the so-called doctor friend who helped your mother. And six, an estate in the Pennines whose owner is a doctor. No! There are some things that are so personal that nobody may meddle with them. Now, I should never have agreed to this exercise in the first place. It was a reckless, foolish thing to do, but you must go now, at once. I take my leave now. You have no need to show me out. Leave! Yes, sir. I would ask you to show the gentleman out. Steve, I would ask you not to readmit Mr. Selden. Mr. Selden? Very good, sir. I should have thought of this far earlier. And I want you to send an urgent telegram to Green Smith, because he's going to have to explain what he's doing employing such a man. Very good, sir. Thank <laughs> you. 
Dear Arthur, do not remotely understand. No employee named Seldon. Have sent nobody. Was awaiting your instructions. Greenhouse Smith. Do you wish to reply further, sir? Um, no. No, not yet. Is everything all right, sir? Yes, Cleve, everything's fine. Don't wait up. I have some work to finish before I go to bed. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night. apologize for my appearance. I had a fall. So you are flesh and blood. So it would seem. Well, that's a relief. I feel we have more to say. I only want to have it out, then I will go. But it is a dangerous habit to finger loaded firearms in the pocket of one's dressing gown. Yes, all right. You quote from my last Holmes adventure, The Final Problem. Tell me, do you know all of the stories by heart? Oh, yes. Then I will observe my hero's own response and put it within reach. arrived at the secret you've carried all these years and the reason why your stories are so filled with violence and dark family secrets. It is an attested fact, is it not, that you made the decision to kill Holmes close to the time of your father's death? We have already talked of his effect on my work. It's not a happy link, but I can live with it. You recall I itemized the clues which led me there. Each one of these facts reflects in its own small way what is clearly omitted from every single account of that awful time in Edinburgh. Something very simple. There was someone else in the house. Would it be fair to say you had a major role to play there? Fair? That would be an understatement. You see, effectively, the Doyle household became my household. He could never understand what happened between this new man and his mother. And what did? Though it cannot be spoken abroad, I, uh, I saved them from the workhouse. But why did you show such philanthropy to the family? Well, I suppose you could say I took a liking to them. Especially one of them. So, you lost a father and found a usurper in his place in your own home. A situation worthy of Hamlet. A devastating blow, and one that might have been critical, all the more since you felt responsible. Do you remember how you described your father to me? That creature locked away in an upstairs room. 
Sometimes a doctor friend of my mother's would come round and with his help, we'd have to restrain him. But you are not quite honest. The so-called doctor friend was Waller all along, and yes, it is true, difficult times followed, but your father was not as violent as described. Not a true monster. Just a man suffering from an illness that is seen as a stigma. And someone miraculous appeared. And something miraculous happened. Every tiny detail, every button, every line, every gesture, every hair, every speck, many of use and value to us. Do not see, observe, ignore nothing. They may laugh at you. In the end, you will confound them. Out the door. Yes, sir. You will be my clerk. At last, in your mind, you had a true father. A properly heroic father. A father to guide you. To help you, to bring you on. To solve the clues. And one who would become your creation. A character so convincing, so real, that people everywhere believed in his existence. And in time, this belief could only mock your pain. For what would ever happen if the audience stripped him away and found what lay beneath? Help me. What are you? Some creature born of my own guilt, some mad vision of my own creation that's come back to haunt me. Followed me. I killed you. Why do you come back now? Because I've never been away. You see, the wounds you inflicted on me at Reichenbach are gone. I will tell you why. The same reason you wanted to talk to your father. You wanted so badly his forgiveness. You thought that by killing me, you could turn away from his suffering. But you were wrong. What happened? His misery and betrayal. It was not your fault. Stay away from me. I don't want you near me. I can feel you, you're warm. Of course you can feel me. I am your heart. Do you not understand yet? I am your heart. I can assure you it's nothing to do with our friendship. That is sacred. But this is something I have to do. Something I must do. I will admit I've been troubled. Unsure of so much. 
but I'm sure that this is a mission, not an escape. In December, Britain lost three major battles in succession. Arthur queued for hours to join the Middlesex Yeomanry to fight the Boers, only to be rejected on grounds of age. Finally, he sailed to South Africa for service as a doctor on the front line and did not return to England until the late summer of 1900. still feel like you're being followed. What? No. No, I do not. Oh, it feels like a long time ago. Have you back, Arthur? Yes, and in one piece. Will you not come in and see him? Another time, maybe. Those who love reunite when they pass on. I know you are writing again. Yes. Tell me. <laughs> um, well, the character that I'm writing at the moment is a man named Seldon. But he's... Not all he seems, he masks another man. Seldon? Mm. You mentioned a researcher of that name. Oh, did I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, well, forget about that. Uh, that was, um, that was, that was just a mad idea I had. He's just a character in a book. <laughs> Outside, the sun was sinking low and the west was blazing with scarlet and gold. Its reflection was shot back in ruddy patches by the distant pools which lay amid the great Grimpen Mire. There were the two towers of Baskerville Hall, and there a distant blur of smoke which marked the village of Grimpen. All was sweet and mellow and peaceful in the golden evening light, and yet as I looked at them, my soul shared none of the peace of nature but quivered at the vagueness and the terror of that interview which every instant was bringing nearer. With tingling nerves but a fixed purpose, I sat in the dark recess of the hut and waited with somber patience for the coming of its tenant. And then at last I heard him. Far away came the sharp clink of a boot striking upon stone. Then another, and yet another, coming nearer and nearer. I shrank back into the darkest corner and cocked the pistol in my pocket, determined not to discover myself until I had an opportunity of seeing something of the stranger. There was a long pause which showed that he had stopped. Then once more the footsteps approached, and a shadow fell across the opening of the hut. 
It is a lovely evening, my dear Watson. I really think you would be more comfortable outside than in. Holmes, I cried. Holmes! I don't care who sees. Everything's changed. Yes. Yes, it has. Arthur Conan Doyle spectacularly resurrected Holmes in The Hound of the Baskervilles in August 1901. The novel became a worldwide sensation and the most popular of his books. Following the death of his wife, Tui, Arthur was finally free to marry Jean Leckie.